On today's mailbag episode, what would Notre Dame's offense look like with Riley Leonard? And would Notre Dame have made the college football playoff if they ran the table this season? That's all coming up. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome to Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Friday, December 8th, so happy Friday, and thank you for getting your day started right here by making this your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Tyler Wojak. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer covering college football for Fox Sports. And today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks. Go to pricepicks.com slash college and use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for a first deposit match up to $100. Daily Fantasy Sports, made easy. Today's episode is going to be a little bit shorter than normal. I'm recording this on Thursday afternoon, and to be honest with you, I was expecting that we might get some big news today about some potential additions in the transfer portal, but that has not happened yet. Maybe by the time you're listening to this, it will have already come out, and I'll get to it in Monday's episode, and I think you kind of know where I'm getting at here. But if you're not caught up with this week's episodes, you should go check them out once you're done with this one. Luke Smith was on Tuesday's show, like he always is, and we covered a bunch of stuff, but most notably, we were pretty disappointed about Notre Dame's bowl destination, the fact that they're going to the Sun Bowl didn't really get us too riled up, I should say. And it sounds like a lot of Notre Dame players are going to be opting out from that game as well. So maybe they feel the same way we do about heading to El Paso for the Sun Bowl. Then on Wednesday, I talked a lot about how incredible it is that Xavier Watts won the Bronco Nagurski Award, went over his journey uh, and how he went from a three-star wide receiver recruit to the top defensive player in all of college football. And I also broke down Notre Dame's two commits uh, via the transfer portal and former FIU wide receiver Chris Mitchell and former Arizona State Nickel Jordan Clark. Yesterday, I made a list of Notre Dame's biggest needs in the transfer portal by position. So now we're all cut up uh, on this week's content. Now let's get to the mailbag questions. This first one comes from um, at Andrew Gilmore, 1443. This year, Jared Parker essentially ran the same scheme that Tommy Reese did at Notre Dame. Do you anticipate some major changes to the scheme in 2024? He should have time to make changes. Riley Leonard is a completely different quarterback than Hartman. Why not implement some Hugh Freeze or Gus Melzahn type concepts? Okay, did not expect a Hugh Freeze reference on this podcast, but here we are. I understand what you're getting at here, uh, Andrew, and I do think that Notre Dame's offense is going to change next season because you're right. It absolutely has to. Riley Leonard's skill set is completely different than Sam Hartman's. It's completely different than Drew Pine's, but it's actually not that uh, different than what Tyler Buckner did at Notre Dame. Buckner was... I don't know if you'd say he was a run first, but it certainly felt like he was a run first quarterback during his time at Notre Dame. And I think that what Notre Dame ran in that Gator Bowl against South Carolina, they ran a lot of RPO, a lot of designed runs to the quarterback, and it worked pretty well. Tyler Buckner just had an affinity for throwing the ball to the other team. But when Notre Dame was running the ball with Buckner, they actually moved the ball pretty well, particularly in that game. I think that Riley Leonard is a guy who you have to incorporate in the run game, uh, especially against better defenses, right? Like Notre Dame probably isn't going to be running Riley Leonard a whole lot when they're going up against some of the weaker teams on the schedule. It's the same thing that Duke did. Like when I was getting ready for Notre Dame's game against Duke, I'd go through the game logs and Riley Leonard's attempts against some of the worst teams on their schedule, like UConn, for example, which is kind of a diss to UConn, shout out Huskies. Um, When they ran, I don't think he ran the ball at all against UConn. So I think Notre Dame is going to try to use him wisely, but they're definitely going to run some read options, some RPO stuff for him to get him involved because he is at his best when he's making plays with his feet. He still has a strong arm, and then you can use that RPO game to hit some deep shots downfield. Uh, We'll find out who's going to be catching those deep shots, and uh, I think that the offense is going to be a lot different. It's still going to be pro style in the sense that Notre Dame is going to like to uh, run 12 personnel and run the ball like they have in past seasons, but I don't think it's going to be just like hand the ball off to Arja Gesme in between the tackles and let him work. There's going to be a lot more misdirection. Um, We know Jared Parker likes to pull the guard and the tackle, so I think that's all going to carry over to next season, but there's going to be a lot more uh, spread concepts like you've seen from guys like Hugh Freeze or Gus Malzahn. It's just going to be in like the Notre Dame way with a lot more tight ends on the field. Okay, next question. Uh, at Ander Season 5321, do you think a Riley Leonard commitment in the next day or two would help Notre Dame land some of the receivers who currently don't know for sure who would be throwing them the ball next year? I think they kind of know. <laughs> I think the receivers know at this point who's going to be the quarterback for Notre Dame next season, especially considering uh, Bo Collins and Josh Kelly. Bo Collins, the receiver from Clemson, and Josh Kelly, the receiver from Washington State. They took their official visit at the same time as Riley Leonard. And 
Uh, there's enough smoke out there for me to think that Riley Leonard is going to be the quarterback in Notre Dame. I think they understand it too. So I don't think the commitment is going to change anything. But I do think it was good that Riley Leonard was there with those wide receiver prospects uh, and getting a chance to meet with them, talk to them a little bit. I just think that's encouraging, right? Because these guys are going to want to know who's throwing them the ball. And even if they got a chance to meet with Steve Angeli, it's pretty clear that Riley Leonard is going to be the guy for Notre Dame next year. And considering Notre Dame doesn't even have a wide receivers coach currently on staff, we all know it's going to be Mike Brown, uh, the former wide receivers coach at Wisconsin, the official announcement has not been made by Notre Dame, so I don't understand um, how his communication works with the players. I don't even know if it's legal. I don't know how much Mike Brown is able to communicate with Bo Collins and with Josh Kelly and even Chris Mitchell, for that matter, who just committed to Notre Dame. So it, considering those guys don't even have a wide receivers coach to talk to legally, um, they're probably talking to Marcus Freeman a whole lot and Jared Parker a whole lot and probably Riley Leonard. It's good to have as many guys communicating with them as possible. Is that going to ultimately decide or is that ultimately going to be the reason they decide to come to Notre Dame or not? I don't know, but I think it certainly helps the cause for the Irish. All right, we've got a bunch more questions to get to and we'll get right to them right after this. This episode of Lockdown Irish is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is a skill based, real money daily fantasy sports game. You've heard me talk about Prize Picks before, and I have had so much fun playing it during the football season, and now you can play it during basketball season as well. You just select two or more players and pick more or less in their projected stats and place your entry. Price Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Price Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy, and that's just one of the reasons why I think it's the best daily fantasy game out there. Go to PricePix.com slash LockedOnCollege and use code LockedOnCollege for a first deposit match to $100. That's PricePix.com slash LockedOnCollege, code LockedOnCollege for a first deposit match up to $100. Price Picks daily fantasy sports made easy. Before we move on, this is your reminder to please like the video below and subscribe to the channel. If you're watching on YouTube or if you're on the go, you're listening to the podcast, you can rate the show five stars, leave a review, and of course, subscribe from wherever it is that you're tuning in to the podcast. All right, let's get back to the questions here. This is one, uh, this is another one from Anderson Season 5321. I noticed you didn't mention tight end, uh, running back, or cornerback as positions we need to be looking for in the transfer portal. I'm not surprised by this because I think those rooms are strong. Either way, I'd like to hear your thoughts on them. Specifically, the tight end room without stays, cornerback room without heart, and most notably, your thoughts on the running back room without Audric Estime. So it wouldn't shock me if Notre Dame went in the transfer portal and added a tight end. Um, maybe they'll have a better sense of Mitchell Levin's uh, injury timeline after spring practice. Maybe they try to add a guy in that cycle. I don't expect there's going to be like a top tier tight end available at that time, but maybe they just need another guy in the room. But right now, I think best case scenario for Notre Dame is that Mitchell Evans is practicing with the team at the start of next season, and he'll be able to play and be at full go by October. Um, as I understand, this is his first ACL tear, so that's encouraging. It's not like Eli Raridan, who tore his second ACL and then needed a little bit more time to recover. He didn't really start to make his mark uh, on the team this past season until like beyond halfway through. So if Mitchell Evans is healthy, if he's able to contribute early on, I think it's less of a necessity to get a tight end, and that's why I don't think they're going to make a move in this transfer portal cycle. Even though that Holden stays left, Cooper Flanagan really impressed this year. He's really uh, played a lot more than I expected him to. Uh, Eli Raritan, if he can just stay healthy, he might be the most talented of the entire bunch. So I feel like they're in a good place. They have numbers. They always recruit the position well, so I don't think it's as much of a need there. Uh, for cornerback, I mean, what Mike Mickens has done to that room on the recruiting trail and as a developer of talent is unlike anything we've seen at Notre Dame in a really long time. He has recruited so well that Notre Dame just doesn't really need a true outside corner. They've got Christian Gray. They've got Jaden Mickey. They obviously have Benjamin Morrison leading the way. Um, and even though it's nice to have an experienced guy like Jordan Clark, or maybe even if it's Clarence Lewis playing that nickel position, that's why they went out and got a guy in the transfer portal. But behind Benjamin Morrison, they have plenty of talented guys. I don't think they need a corner, even though they're going to lose Cam Hart. And then running back, pretty much the same deal. Um, Dylan McCall has recruited the position very well. Now, I've been asked before, like, if there was an assistant who is most likely most likely to leave, who would it be? I would say probably Dylan McCullough. If Dylan McCullough does leave, does that mean that Notre Dame could potentially lose one of their guys? Maybe. 
Uh, I wouldn't write it off, but then again, I wouldn't write off any single player from transferring at any time. Like these these things happen; they could happen quickly. Like last year, Logan Diggs went through spring practice and then decided he wanted to go to LSU um, after that was over. So right now, assuming all these positions stay the way they are, uh, I feel like Notre Dame is set at tight end, cornerback, and a running back, even though they're going to lose some top pieces. Okay, next question. This is uh, this is a good one at uh, Dan O'Carter. Had Notre Dame ran the table this year, would they have definitely gotten into the college football playoff? I'm not sure. I'm not so sure. That was Dan saying, I'm not so sure. And to be honest, I feel like I agree with him. I think they would have gotten it. A 12 0 Notre Dame team, even though they didn't play in a conference championship, I think they would have made the playoff because I think whether or not they want to say it publicly, what Notre Dame brings to the table in terms of television revenue. Um, the draw to the game beyond television too, like just the importance, the magnitude of that game with an undefeated Notre Dame team playing in the college football playoff is very important to the people who run the college football playoff. And those are the television executives. Now the conversation about that would not have been fun. It would have been pretty brutal. Um, And to be honest with you, the team who might've had the biggest issue with Notre Dame getting in would probably have been Georgia because Georgia also finished the regular season undefeated, and they would essentially be getting punished for losing the SEC championship, for playing that extra game and losing to a team like Alabama, who, as you know, is really, really good. So, again, I think Notre Dame would have gotten in, but I think that Georgia would have been extremely upset. Uh, I think they would have gotten in over Alabama, so Alabama would have been extremely upset. Um, Texas would have been in. Washington uh, Washington was a lot to get in. They went 13-0 won their conference championship in probably the best year in the history of the Pac-12, or at least in the past couple of decades, I should say. Certainly in the playoff era, the best uh, the best season the Pac-12 has ever had. So I look at Michigan and Washington as complete locks. I think Texas probably would have been a lock as well, um, considering if they were to take or if they were to put Notre Dame in and uh, put Texas in, I think that would have made the most sense. But it would have been a really, really interesting discussion. And, you know, assuming Notre Dame is fully healthy, right? Like the committee couldn't use the injury approach like they did with Florida State. Like if Jordan Travis was healthy, I still don't know if Florida State would have gotten into the playoff. The committee would have had to come up with some uh, real, uh, a real new excuse for why they wanted to put Alabama in over them without just saying, hey, they're in the SEC and Florida State's in the ACC, so therefore we're putting Alabama in the college football playoff and not you. It would have been a, a really interesting discussion. Now, I wouldn't go as far to say that like it would have forced Notre Dame to join a conference. I have seen that take thrown out there. That doesn't really make any sense to me because the playoff is going to expand next year and it really wouldn't matter. So if Notre Dame was going to be forced to join a conference, why would they be forced to do it right before the playoff expands? Like If the 14 playoff would have continued beyond this season and then this situation would have happened and everyone would have been in an uproar that a team uh, who went undefeated and got into the college football playoff without playing a conference championship game got in over like Georgia and those other schools. Yeah, it would have been a lot. It would not have been fun to deal with, but uh, I guess it would have been a fun problem to have because Notre Dame would have been undefeated and not 9-3 in playing in the Sun Bowl. All right, a couple more questions left coming up right after this. This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you you need at the prices you want. It's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebay.com slash motors. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Okay, our next question comes from Drew Brennan 77, uh, a mailbag staple. Shout out to Drew. He asks, with all that is happening with the transfer portal, do you think we will see teams signing smaller freshman classes knowing they can fill, fulfill those needs in the portal, but also knowing that freshmen could easily leave after one year or two? This is a really good question, and I think that a lot of teams, actually every team for that matter, has to reconsider their approach to high school recruiting, but it's not necessarily about signing less guys. It's about figuring out, okay, these are the high school kids that we absolutely know we want to sign. Like, guys are going to still go out there, they're going to recruit high school kids, and they're going to have their top-of-the-board guys that they're going to have 
they're going to want to have sign and commit on signing day. But the tricky thing is, especially with the timing of how all this works out, the portal opens December 4th. National Signing Day is in a couple weeks. These coaches don't have a full understanding of their scholarship roster because they know that some of their guys are going to leave and they need to know how many of those guys are going to leave and then how many guys do they need to fill via the transfer portal. And I think that more coaches across the country are a little bit inclined to, if they need to fill a spot, they're going to want to do it with a guy who has college tape. And they're going to want to do it with a guy who they at least have some idea how their game is translated to the college level. So the four and five star high school recruits out there, those kids are absolutely fine. Every, you know, there's programs all around the country that's always going to want their services. If you're a really top of the line high school player, you are going to have a home and in college football, in college football, no matter what. Who really gets hurt by all of this is like three star and below. Uh, and I know that some people are like, oh, well, they're just three stars. Well, three star. there's a ton of three stars. And there's a ton of like lower level three stars who are playing college or playing high school football around the country uh, in some smaller towns who are really, really good players who aren't really getting that many looks by college coaches, uh, certainly not in the way that they used to. Um, I know that my cousin, he's a senior in high school right now, really good football player in Ohio, Jack Wojak, shout out. He's been, he's got a few shout outs on the show already. His situation is pretty interesting because he's sort of in that in that range, and college coaches have been pretty transparent about the fact that, like, hey, we like your game, but they're kind of leaning more towards the transfer portal, and it really complicates things with who they can offer a scholarship to because there's kids out there who are like, if you offer them a scholarship, they're obviously going to take it, right? They're going to want to take their game to the next level, but then a coach can't really go back on that and be like, hey, actually, that spot we had reserved for you, that the one that you committed, the one that you signed for, we actually would like to uh, – give that spot to a, this player that we just got out of the transfer portal. So what these coaches are doing is they're just not offering as many guys in that range. And like for the, from the Notre Dame perspective, I don't think that part really affects them as much. Um, I think Notre Dame is going to continue to sign 20 plus guys every single year. Marcus Freeman has said that they'll look at the transfer portal to fill the gaps, but they're going to be a program built on recruiting um, the best high school kids they can get, and they're going to develop them, and they're going to want to grow them within their program, which I think is the right way to do it. Like, look at Georgia. Look at Alabama. Yes, they add guys in the transfer portal, but their main priority is just recruiting and landing five stars every single year. And then those guys develop in their program. They develop into future NFL pros. So that's the way the top programs do it. But the other schools that you mentioned, like with all this happening around the country, I think that the transfer portal affects them in a much different way because they aren't Alabama, they aren't Georgia. And like for the smaller schools out there who are basically becoming feeder schools for the big time schools, like even schools at like the MAC level, they get a guy who ends up being really good for their team. And then they realize, wait a second, not only can I go somewhere else and play big time college football, I can also make a lot more money doing it. They're going to take that route. It's a really unfortunate uh, sort of side effect of the transfer portal that that level gets hit really hard and hit really negatively. But it's just sort of uh, the nature of the beast now. And I think it's going to be even more interesting once the 12-team playoff comes into effect next year. And even though the talent might spread out a little bit, I think it's going to hurt those lower levels uh, even more because guys are going to have more opportunities to play in the college football playoff. They're going to have more opportunities to leave. And uh, it's just a really difficult situation if you're those college coaches. So I don't envy them. But again, I, I don't think this is going to be a problem for the Notre Dame side uh, as much as it is for them. They're going to sit they're going to continue to recruit, uh, and they're going to recruit really, really hard. That is something that Marcus Freeman made very clear in his introductory press conference, and he has made, uh, or he he has backed that up every step of the way since he was hired. But that is going to do it for me today. I did not get to all of the mailbag questions I wanted to get to today, and I'm sorry. Any question that I didn't get to this week will be addressed in the next mailbag episode. But that's another week of Locked On Irish in the Books. Thanks again for making it your first listen of the day. Uh, before you head out, get a head start in your weekend. Please subscribe on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the podcast and give us a follow on X at Locked On Irish, on Instagram at Locked On Irish Pod. You can also follow my personal X account at Tyler W O J C I A K. Enjoy your weekend, and I will see you on Monday.